The history of 3D printing as a named concept is datable with unusual, so as not to say unique, precision. On the 30th of January 1989, a man named Chuck Hull appeared on the TV programme Good Morning America to talk about his own invention, sterilithography, and told his interviewer and audience, quote, I think a good way to describe it is to call it a three-dimensional printer. End quote. Now, we cannot be sure whether he actually coined the term 3D printing or whether it was already floating around by then in technology circles, but we do know that he made up the word sterilithography and that this was the first and remains to this day one of the most important 3D printing technologies around. Patent he filed for his invention was issued in March 1986 and it secured him and the company he co founded, 3D Systems, a big head start and operational monopoly, certainly on this particular type of 3D printing technology, for the next 20 years. 3D Systems is still one of the major players in the market and Chuck Hull, as we speak, now aged 83, is widely recognised and variously awarded for his achievements. So you might be forgiven for thinking he would be a good historical figure for us to focus on in the context of 3D printing. And you'd be right, which is why we mention him here, not as a footnote, but as a preamble, so to speak, to the person we do want to introduce here, who could in almost every imaginable way, not be more different. While Chuck Hull had studied engineering physics and became, over his highly successful career, the title holder of over 60 US patents, Brie Pettis, born just about a generation later and now in his early 50s today, studied psychology, mythology and the performing arts. Before he had anything to do with 3D print, for which he was to become a poster boy, he odd-jobbed in the film industry and in retail and then qualified as a teacher, a profession he carried out for some six years until 2006. Which is exactly the time that things started to get really interesting for 3D printing. With Chuck Hull's patent on stereolithography expired and 3D systems hold on the technology thus loosened, the scene was finally set for a new kind of startup to enter the fray. Pettis became involved in the New York hacker scene, helping to found the hackerspace NYC Resistor. It was here that the idea for a fully open source, consumer level 3D printer was born the MakerBot. Pettis was one of three friends from NYC Resistor who founded MakerBot Industries to enter the race for winning, in inverted commas, the 3D print revolution. The other two were Adam Mayer, who was responsible for software, and Zach Hoken, who headed up engineering. Pettis, for his charismatic personality and ease with people and the media, was put in charge of design and marketing and elected CEO. Just how palpable the sense of things being on the move was and how exciting the next eight years would become was called by filmmakers Luis Lopez and Clay Tweed who happened to be flies on the wall as it were for their feature length documentary Print the Legend which they released in 2014. In it you hear people speak of the search and opportunity for a major social innovator, such as Henry Ford or Steve Jobs, someone who would take this technology and make it available to everyone, someone who would bring industrial processes comfortably dominated by Chuck Hull's 3D systems and their chief competitor Stratasys and take them to the desktop, just as had happened with computers. Marie Pettis became the man who, at least for a few short years, found himself in that role. Beloved, as one of the interlocutors of the film puts it, in the maker movement, he had a way with words, knew how to use the then still fairly new social media platforms such as YouTube, which had posted its first video only recently in 2005, a year before Pettis quit teaching, 
and with his father, who also, as it happens, is named Chuck, and who was himself an entrepreneur who understood the power of a brand, Pettis was well positioned to play the part. Makerbot Industries launched its first generation Makerbot 3D printer in 2009, and by 2012, Pettis was on the cover of Wired magazine. The 3D print revolution was well underway and it had its very own Che Guevara, an instantly recognisable figure who did not shy away from the limelight. At exactly the same time, another three friends who met at MIT Media Lab founded Formlabs to do more or less the same thing as a direct competitor to Makerbot Industries. One of the people involved describes what they were doing in similarly breathless terms. This wasn't a company, he's heard saying. This was a movement. This was a revolution. Formlabs is still going as an independent, privately owned company employing some 500 people. 3D Systems, which is a publicly traded corporation by revenue as well as staff at least five times the size, continues to be a market leader, particularly in the industrial sector. And for Brie Pettis and Makerbot, things took a turn to the previously unexpected when, first of all, Pettis abandoned the open source model to make Makerbot Industry a closed source manufacturer in 2012, and then allowed Stratasys, the big corporate competitor, to acquire them in 2013 for roughly 600 million US dollars. This did not go down well with the community that had so treasured him. And perhaps that's understandable. Many of them had invested hundreds, indeed thousands of hours of their own time into helping develop these open source printers. He had effectively sold out. He was briefly kept on as CEO of MakerBot, but got replaced following year, in 2014, by one of the people he himself had brought in to help usher in the rapid growth of the company he had co-founded. Since then, Brie Pettis has been involved in other startups and most recently has embarked on making YouTube videos on how to make YouTube videos. So, will history remember Brie Pettis as the man who led the 3D printing revolution? The more pertinent question may well be, did the 3D printing revolution happen? And if so, what has it brought about? There is no doubt that 3D printing has revolutionised many aspects of highly specialised industries, most particularly in aeronautics, medicine and high-end manufacture. But at a consumer level, it has not really in that sense materialised, and perhaps the demand for personally owned machines that can make bespoke objects simply isn't that great. Which does not mean that 3D printing at prosumer and small business level, at educational and studio level, and therefore almost by definition also for architects, does not have a great deal of potential yet. The Danish physicist Niels Bohr is credited with saying, quote, prediction is very difficult, especially if it is about the future, end of quote. And so we must leave it to time to tell us who among the cast of notables in the story of 3D printing will be remembered and what for. What is certain is that Brie Pettis, who is after all a trained performer, played his part and did so prominently and apparently well at least for some of his time as the lead. In the fast-moving world of technology startups, feathers get ruffled, egos bruised and lofty principles ditched for the pragmatism of sheer survival in among the ravenous predation of commercial capitalism. The fact that Brie Pettis does not get exclusively good press and high praise need not, therefore, surprise us or wholly define our impression of him. And so I feel inclined to give him the penultimate word in this short portrait about himself. He is, after all, a living human being. He says on his website, quote, I'm curious about the state of things and what could come next. How will we make a better society? How do we create infrastructure for more creativity and awareness? 
When will modern capitalism transform to address inequity? How do stories transform our collective participation? End of quote. We shall see, Brie. We shall see.